Hello and very warm welcome. Dear students, we will discuss wood structure in relation to water and mineral absorption. Wood is a complex biological structure, a composite of many chemistries and cell types acting together to serve the needs of a living plant. In this content, the main attempt is to understand wood in relation to conduction of water and minerals from roots to leaves. To accomplish this function, the components of wood must have the cells that are designed and interconnected in ways sufficient to perform this function or fully involved in either support or conduction of water and minerals from roots to aerial parts of plants. Wood comes from trees, therefore wood is of plant origin. But all plants are not productive of timber. The plants may be woody or non-woody. The following criteria will serve to distinguish. Number one, they must be vascular plants, that is, they must possess specialized conducting tissues consisting of phloem and xylem. Plants in which there is no vascular tissue cannot produce wood. Number second, they must be perennial plants, that is, they must live for a number of years. Annual plants complete their life cycle within one season and biennials live for two years. Number three, they must possess a stem that persists from year to year in the case of tree which is also called as bowl. In addition to the above, typical woody plants exhibit secondary thickness that is they have a means of thickening of their stem by subsequent growth in diameter. This is achieved through the activities of cambium which is situated just outside the last formed layer of wood and beneath the inner bark or phloem. This produces new phloem and secondary xylem yearly which are inserted between the older secondary xylem and the bark. In this manner, a trunk attains a diameter sufficient to make it profitable to convert it into lumber. To understand this topic fully, the content has been divided into two aspects as structural aspect and functional aspect. The structural aspect consists of structure and function of various wood elements and functional aspect throws light on how water and minerals get transported through these elements. Structural aspect. The increase in the thickness of the axis of a plant body is known as secondary growth and is typical of dicotyledons and gymnosperms. Monocotyledons do not show secondary growth except few species. It is brought about by the activity of vascular cambium. Vascular cambium is a primary meristem situated between xylem and phloem. Vascular cambium consists of two types of cells, the fusiform inshells and the ray inshells. Fusiform inshells produce secondary xylem, that is wood, and phloem, and the ray inshells, the medullary rays. When secondary growth proceeds, secondary xylem is produced towards the center. It pushes the primary xylem towards the pith. The primary xylem is seen in the form of conical projections. Secondary xylem pushes inside. The pith is completely obliterated and the whole of the central cylinder is occupied by the secondary xylem. Secondary xylem forms the bulk of the vascular tissue in woody plants and also the bulk of entire plant body. And in such plants, this tissue is of great importance because through its functions, a huge plant body may be maintained in the atmosphere with its various parts favorably exposed to light and air. Mechanically, xylem supports and anchors the plant body. Physiologically, it conducts water 
and other inorganic materials absorbed by roots to all living parts of the plant. The most distinctive feature characterizing the secondary xylem is the existence of two systems of elements which differ in the orientation of their longitudinal axis. One system is vertical and the other is horizontal. The horizontal system comprises the xylem rays and the vertical or axial system the trichary elements, fibers and wood pan chyma. In conducting elements, we have tracheids and vessels as basic types of xylem. The end walls of the vessel are perforated. The vessel which is also called as trachea is built of various vessel members which are joined end to end by end walls. In the longitudinal radial section of vascular bundle, it can be seen that vessels and tracheids differ from each other in shape and structure of secondary wall. In many plants, the secondary wall thickening of the first formed element is annular or the helical, which may give rise to sclat form thickenings. In the element of still later stage, the wall thickening is in the form of network and this type of thickening is called as reticulate. In the ontogenetically advanced types, the cell wall is interrupted only at pits and this type of thickening is called pitted. In this pitted type, we have simple and bordered pits. The wall develop bordered pit pairs which are usually present between the two xylem elements is called intravascular pitting. Between conducting elements and fibers, there are very few or no pits. Pitted trichary elements with annular and helical thickening is found in most of trichophytes, with the exception of some lower plants and hydrophytes. Elements with such wall thickening give support to the thickening and pitted elements are considered as more efficient for conduction. The absence of living protoplasts, development of elongated tracheids and occurrence of vessel elements are all features which increases the conduction of water. Bordered pits are well adapted to their function as they combine both the tracheids. One hand, in case of bordered pit, the area of pit membrane is comparatively large, so the passage of water is easier. On the other hand, the secondary wall is maximum because it makes an arch to the pit membrane and this is the feature of great strength. In case of trache, more rapid conduction is obtained by elongation of cells, increase in diameter of lumen, number of pits and reduction in wall thickness, while as strength of tissues is brought about by the shortening of cells, narrowing of lumen, increase in wall thickness, a reduction of pits. In conifers, early wood is more adapted for efficient water conduction and tracheids of late wood for support. Conduction is further facilitated by the complete disappearance of pit membrane in certain area, resulting in the formation of vessels. In the secondary xylem of certain primitive dicots, primitive vessel members which resemble pitty tracheids and thick walled narrow tracheids have been observed occurring side by side. Perforation palate may be simple or scleriform. Sometimes bars of thickening may be laid down so as to connect consecutive rings of the scleriform plate to form its reticulate perforation and sometimes the alignment of the apertures may differ on opposite sides of a single perforation palate. It is called dimorphic. The structure of dimorphic perforation palates has been considerably clarified by using scanning electron microscope. Occasional perforations are formed in the wall 
between a vessel and ray cell. They occur in both of the radial walls of a single ray cell, thus forming a link between a vessel and opposite sides of a ring. Such links may pass through between two ray cells. Wood parenchyma. There are two types of parenchyma found in the secondary xylem. First type is axial parenchyma and second is ray parenchyma. The ray parenchyma cells originate from special relatively short cambial initials while the cells of the axial parenchyma develop from fusiform initials. All ray parenchyma cells may have secondary walls or only primary walls developed. Where the secondary wall is developed, pit piers may be simple, hop bordered or even bordered. There are two categories of xylem parenchyma. Storage parenchyma cells and vessel associated cells are contact cells. The cells of strong parenchyma stores reserve food material like starch and fats. Tannins, crystals, silica bodies and other substances also frequently found in many of these cells. Contact parenchyma cells have numerous pits between them and the adjacent vessels they contain have numerous vacuoles and mitochondria well developed endoplasmic reticulum and little or no storage material. Like transfer cells, contact cells seem to be involved in metabolism especially in carbohydrate metabolism and short distance transport. Braun in 1983 suggested that vessel associated tissue consists of paratracheal contact parenchyma and it may play a role in the mechanism of water ascent in trees by releasing osmotically active substances into the vessels. Rays The number of xylem rays of a trunk increases with the increase in its girth. The dimensions of the rays vary in different plants and sometimes even in the same plant. When the ray is one cell wide, it is said to be unicerate. When it is two cell wide, it is bicerate. And when it is more than two cell wide, it is multicerate. In a TS transverse section, a unicerate ray is seen to become narrow towards both its lower and upper edges, where it is usually unicerate. When in a single ray, two cell types are present that is upright and procumbent. The ray is said to be heterogeneous. When only one cell type is present, the ray is homogeneous. Rays in the secondary vascular tissues of trees serve as transverse avenues of conduction. Xylem fibers. Fibers are the most commonly found among the vascular tissues, but in many plants they are also well developed in the ground tissues. Fibers are classified in two basic categories or types, xylary fibers and extraxylary fibers. Xylary fibers constitute an integral part of the xylem. There are two main types of xylem fibers, namely fiber tracheids and libriform fibers. Fiber tracheids and libriform fibers both are distinguished on the basis of cell wall thickness and type and amount of pits. The fiber tracheid is a cell in the xylem that is interlinked between a tracheid and a libriform fiber and their walls are of medium thickness. Not as thick as those of libriform fibers but thicker than those of tracheids. The pits are bordered but their pit chambers are smaller in size than those of tracheids. The libriform fiber is a cell in the xylem that is long and thin without border in the pits and it is also called as xylary fiber. To differentiate from extra xylary fiber occur in the phloem and often called as bas fiber, libriform fibers resemble phloem fibers and they are longer than the tracheids of the plant in which they occur. In case of secondary xylem of gymnosperms, there are fundamental differences 
in the histological structure of wood of dicots and that of gymnosperm. In the timber trade, the wood of the dicot ledens is known as hardwood and that of gymnosperms as softwood. But these terms do not accurately express the degree of hardness as in both groups wood with hard and soft structure can be found. The structure of secondary xylem in gymnosperms is simple and more homogeneous than that of the angiosperms. The principal differences between the two are the absence of vessels in the wood of gymnosperms and their presence in almost all angiosperms. Relatively small amount of wood parenchyma, especially axial parenchyma in gymnosperms. Vertical system in gymnosperms. In most of gymnosperms, the tracheary elements of the vertical system are tracheids. However, the tracheids of late wood develop relatively thick walls and their pits have small pit chambers and long canals. Because of this structure, these tracheids are termed as fiber tracheids. Libriform fibers are not found in secondary xylem of gymnosperms. The tracheids overlap one another with flat chisel shaped ends. Neighboring tracheids are joined by bordered pits, which may be arranged in a single longitudinal row or in a few rows. From the various investigations, it has been shown that the number of pits per tracheid may be 50 to 300. The size of pits, the shape of pit border and that of pit aperture vary greatly. In a microscopic radial longitudinal section of wood of many gymnosperms, transversely oriented thickening of the wall can be observed on the above or below the pits. These are the thickenings of middle lamella and that of the primary wall. These are called crezulae or bars of senio. Another feature of gymnosperm wood is the occurrence of trabeculae in the tracheids. Trabeculae are rod shaped outgrowths of the tangential cell walls, which grow across the cell lumen so as to contact the tangential walls. Rays in gymnosperms may comprise of parenchyma only that is homocellular rays are parenchyma and tracheids that is heterocellular rays. The ray tracheids are distinguished from ray parenchyma by the presence of border pits and absence of protoplasts. Ray tracheids occur singly or in rows. These may be at the upper or lower edges of the ray or scattered among the ray parenchyma cell. In large majority of gymnosperms, the rays are uniserate and they are usually from 1 to 60 cell high. If a resin duct passes through the center of the ray, it is known as resiniferous ray. The functional aspect of this content, the xylem transports water and soluble mineral nutrients from the roots throughout the plant. Xylem sap consists mainly of water and inorganic ions although it can contain a number of organic chemicals as well. This transport is not powered by energy spent by the tracheary elements themselves, which are dead by maturity and no longer have living contents. There are two phenomena which cause xylem sap to flow. Number one is transpirational pull. The most important cause of xylem sap flow is the evaporation of water from the surfaces of mesophyll cells to the atmosphere. This phenomena is based on two properties of water that is cohesion and adhesion. This phenomena takes into account the continuous unbroken water column in the xylem and tension on the water column created as a result of transpiration. The water evaporates from the mesophyll cells of the leaves increasing the diffusion pressure deficit that is index of absorbing power of a solution. The lost water is replaced by the absorption from the adjacent cells with DPD increasing now starts to go through the xylem vessels resulting formation of chain of pulling waters through xylem of root stem and leaves. Thus the water molecules 
form a long continuous column from roots to the leaves. Transpirational pull requires that the vessels transporting the water are very small in diameter. Otherwise, cavitation would break the water column. And as water evaporates from leaves, more is drawn up through the plant to replace it. When the water pressure within the xylem reaches extreme levels due to low water input from the roots, if for example, the soil is dry, then the gases come out of solution and form a bubble and embolism forms, which will spread quickly to other adjacent cells. Unless powdered pits are present, these have a plug like structures called a torus that seals off the opening between the adjacent cells and stops the embolism from spreading. Number second is root pressure. The water and mineral salts absorbed from the soil by the root hairs gradually accumulate in the cortex. As a result, cortical cells become fully turgid. Under this condition, their elastic walls being much stressed exert pressure on the fluid contents and force it towards the xylem vessels. Once the cortical cells become flaccid, they again absorb water to become turgid. The process continues and an intermittent pumping action goes on in the cortex of the room. This gives rise to a considerable pressure as a result of which the water is forced into the xylem vessels through passage cells of the endoderms and the conducting tissues and pits that the vessels are provided with. Besides the lignified walls of the vessels are also permeable to water. Root pressure is thus the pressure exerted on liquid content of the cortical cells of roots under fully turgid conditions forcing some of it into the xylem vessels and through them upwards into the sitium up to a certain height. The movement of water follows the pathway. Soil, roots, sitium, leaf, then transpiration, then air. Minerals enter the root by active transport into the simplest of epidermal cells and move towards the steel through the plasmodesmata connecting the cells. Endoderms can also provide an upward pressure forcing water out of the roots when transpiration is not enough. Root of water movement. There are three roots water can follow. Number one, apoplastic, non-living regions of the plant. Water follows an apoplastic root from soil through cortex. However, it must enter the steel because of the Casparian strip, where it is transported to the apex of the plant. This appears to be major route of the transport. The second is symplastic transmembrane. In other words, the water moves from cell to cell crossing membranes as it goes. And number three, symplastic plasmodesmata. The water moves from cell to cell via the plasmodesmata. However, the inner boundary of the cortex, the endoderms, is impervious to water because of a band of subarized matrix called the Casparian strip. Therefore, to enter the steel, apoplastic water must enter the symplasm of the endodermal cells. From here, it can pass by plasmodesmata into the cells of the vascular bundle. In this way, water and minerals reach to the xylem. In addition to this, in most plants, pitted tracheids function as the primary transport cells. The other type of tracheary elements besides the tracheid is the vessel element. In vessels, water travels by bulk flow as in a pipe rather than by diffusion through cell membranes. The presence of vessels in xylem has been considered to be one of the key innovations that led 
to the success of the angiosperms. Wider tracheids allow water to be transported faster, but the overall transport rate depends also on the overall cross sectional area of the xylem bundle itself. The increase in vascular bundle thickness further seems to correlate with the width of plant axis and plant height. It is also closely related to the appearance of leaves and increased stomatal density, both of which would increase the demand for water. While wider tracheids with robust walls make it possible to achieve higher water transport pressures, this increases the problem of cavitation. Cavitation occurs when a bubble of air forms within a vessel, breaking the bonds between the chains of water molecules and preventing them from pulling more water up with their cohesive tension. A tracheid once cavitated cannot have its embolism removed and returned to service, except in a few advanced angiosperms developed a mechanism of doing so. Therefore, it is well worth plants while to avoid cavitation occurring. For this reason, pits in tracheid walls have very small diameter to prevent air entering and allowing bubbles to nucleate. Cavitation is hard to avoid, but once it has occurred, plants have a range of mechanism to contain the damage. Small pits link adjacent conduits to allow fluid to flow between them, but not air. Although ironically, these pits which prevent the spread of embolism are also a major cause of them. These pitted surfaces further reduce the flow of water through the xylem by as much as 30 percent. Tracheids end with walls which impose a great deal of resistance on flow. Vessel members have perforated end walls and are arranged in series to operate as if they were one continuous vessel. Vessels allow the same cross-sectional area of wood to transport around a hundred times more water than tracheids. Recall that flow rate is directly related to the radius of the pipe, Pausilis law. Thus, flow rates in vessels are greater than those in tracheids. But why are not vessels and tracheids for that matter larger especially since it means that they could transport more water? The answer cavitation. As the pipes get larger, the chance of cavitation increases. Dear viewers, with this we conclude today's topic wood structure in relation to water and mineral absorption. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.